Hi, this is Steve Kaufman here. Uh, today I want to talk about how I learned Ukrainian. Now I have been doing most of my videos in my little studio, but today I'm gonna to do it in front of this painting and I'm gonna tell you why. But first of all, if you enjoy my videos, please subscribe, click on the bell for notifications. And if you follow me on a uh, podcast service, please leave a comment. So before I get into talking about how I learned Ukrainian, I'll explain why I'm doing it in front of this painting here. This is a print, of course, it's not an original. It is, uh, what it's called, it's uh, Les Terrasses du Soir au Place du Forum à Arles, painted by the terrace, you know, painted by Van Gogh, Van Gogh in English, the famous uh, Dutch Impressionist painter. And I like doing it in front of this picture because it has the Ukrainian color, the blue and the yellow. Plus, I very much like this print. And, you know, Van Gogh, Van Gogh was a Dutch painter. He spent a lot of time in France, southern France, also in Normandy. And as someone that is interested in languages, you won't be surprised to know that I kind of like the mixture of cultures and even in food, you know, uh, olive oil with my sushi or uh, wasabi with my French food or what, whatever. I like mixing things. And similarly, I like mixing cultures. And I like the way one culture leads you to another. Uh, and by exploring all these different cultures, you learn more and more about the world. And my discovery of Ukrainian and Ukraine is a good example. So, for most of my life, I knew next to nothing about Ukraine. I think like a lot of people, I thought it was some kind of appendage to Russia, similar to Russia, and I didn't know much more than that. Uh, in 2000, and I would say six or seven, I started learning Russian, uh, largely to see whether I could learn a Slavic language with all the complicated grammar uh, without spending a lot of time on grammar. So that was that, plus having read you know, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky in my uh, late teens, I thought it would be cool to read it in the original Russian. So I was with Russian, learning Russian, enjoying Russian, listening to Russian audiobooks, reading on link. And um, of course, in 2008, there was the war in Georgia, which I followed because I followed Echo Moskvi, much to the disappointment of many Russians who are caught up in the sort of propaganda world that has been created in Russia. Uh, they're the only good people in the world. Everybody else is mean to them. And Echemus V was kind of tolerated as sort of a safety valve for a variety of opinions. Uh, a lot of these opinions were critical of the government, but you also had the Communist Party would be interviewed and the, the you know, whatever his name was, I can't remember, Gennady, I can't remember. And um, extreme uh, imperialist types like, uh, I think it's uh, Prokhorov or Prohanov was on there. At any rate, so Russia invaded Georgia. I didn't pay much attention. 2010, there was an election in Ukraine and Yanukovych won. And of course the Russians were following that very closely, but still it was all far away. I didn't pay much attention. Then in 2014, Russia took Crimea. And I watched that and somebody told me that I could follow these events on Ukrainian television. So I started watching a program called Schuster Live. And lo and behold on Schuster Live, half the people speak Russian or spoke Russian, half the people spoke Ukrainian. And as I was listening to the Ukrainian, I felt as though I should be able to understand it, but I couldn't understand it. Very strange feeling because it's pronounced in many ways kind of sounds like Russian, but in fact, so many of the words are different. So, uh, I decided that I would learn Ukrainian. And uh, the, I bought some books on it, starter books, and also uh, Radio Free Europe uh, out of Prague uh, was putting out Radio Svoboda, Svoboda in Ukrainian, put out regular interviews um, where they had both audio and text. So uh, knowing Russian and, and what I discovered was that like half the words are like 60% of the words are like Russian. And so if I had, you know, audio material with transcript, then I could import that into link. And very quickly, 
I could acquire new words. I think my vocabulary count on Link in Ukrainian is like 50 or 60,000 known words. Because so many words, you can guess what they mean. A few you have to learn. And I just listened. I can't imagine. I think I've read one and a half million words of Ukrainian on Link. I don't know how many hours I've listened to. In fact, I'll show you. Uh, in fact, let me show you my profile in Russian, which shows that I begin around 2007. And then you'll see my profile on Ukrainian which shows that I begin around 2014. And you can see where I have been most active in those languages. So, listening to all this stuff, and also Hromatsky Radio, which is uh, a very good source of audio, of, of podcasts, but without transcript. So it was only after training myself on the Radio Free Europe material that I was good enough to understand a lot of the podcasts on Romansky Radio, most of which were in Ukrainian, some of which were in Russian. So I was able to follow the events in the Donbass. But let's go back to Crimea. So I followed the events there. Uh, initially, Russia claimed that the little green men with no military insignia were not their soldiers, which of course was not true. Uh, Putin subsequently admitted that, yes, they're, you know, at first he said, oh, they just bought, so those are just people who went and bought military uh, uniforms at some store, uh, and then he admitted that they were in fact Russian soldiers. And the events in Crimea were planned by a group of agents, Borodai, Girkin, who subsequently went to the Donbass and took what was a quite a volatile situation and turned it into a war. And I followed this uh, daily. Uh, I followed it as, uh, you know, the, the people in the Donbass. And stepping back, obviously there was a lot of tension. You could see this at, at Schuster Live. You had the representatives of the sort of pro-Russian faction. You had uh, uh, the, the right-wing, more nationalistic types, like the head of Party Svoboda. You had this guy, Lyashko, who was a bit of a nutcase, also uh, a right-wing extremist. You had everybody, and you had people who were subsequently identified as being corrupt. You, you know, you had this sense of, of Ukraine is full of these people who are very eloquent and speak with great passion and a, a tremendous range of opinions. And in Schuster Live, as they speak, the people in the audience vote on what they think of what they're saying there. So it was obviously a, a period of tremendous tension because of the events of the Maidan, which had brought in uh, a, a government which was voted by all parties, by the way, uh, which was more pro-Western. It was more sort of pro-nationalist uh, than the previous government under Yanukovych. And there were people in Eastern Ukraine who didn't want that. These are people who had voted for Yanukovych. Their guy fled. So obviously they're upset. I'm watching this in Ukrainian every day, following it. If I get my uh, podcast from uh, Radio, Radio Svoboda, I've now got a text, so I'm very interested in the subject. I'm following it as, uh, you know, Girkin is the first minister of war for the Donbass, uh, what do they call themselves, the Donetsk People's Republic. Borodai is the, the, I think, prime minister of the Donetsk People's Republic. There's a guy called Bessler, who is some kind of a sleeping Russian GRU agent that's been living there and he organizes, you know, uh, militia, and so they go from storming uh, government buildings to eventually having some kind of an armed force. There's a war. The Ukrainian army is very poorly organized between the Ukrainian army and volunteers, largely from Eastern Ukraine. They fight back. They're able to eventually arrive at a sort of a, a, a ceasefire line after the intervention of the Russian, regular Russian army to prevent the Ukrainian army from actually taking back that whole area. There were people killed on both sides, mostly soldiers, Ukrainian soldier, Ukrainian government soldiers, volunteers on the Ukrainian side, the uh, separatist fighters on the other side, Russian soldiers from Ossetia, wherever they came, Yak uh, Yakuta, there was quite a few sort of Mongolian types there who were uh, shown, in, you know, some of them were in hospital with serious, uh, with serious burns and so forth. A very unhappy situation. A lot of people fled, displaced people to other parts of Ukraine. Some fled to Russia. 
Uh, total death toll is supposedly around 15,000. I followed it every day. And so I, with that, my Ukrainian comprehension improved. Now, uh, I, at some point I said, I should start speaking Ukrainian. Very difficult to do because I'm so used to speaking Russian, but I had a Russian tutor who was actually from Ukraine. And so slowly, slowly, I started speaking Ukrainian with her. She subsequently emigrated to the United States with her husband and family. Uh, then I found two more tutors, one in Lviv and one in Dnipro. Uh, the one in Dnipro, eventually, in, at some point, uh, with all of the, the shelling going on back and forth across the demarcation line and people living uh, without gas, without water, I said, I want to do something to help those people. So uh, my uh, Ukrainian tutor in Dnipro introduced me to this small non-governmental organization in uh, Krasnohorivka, which is a, a suburb of the city of Donetsk. And every quarter I sent them money so that they could buy uh, you know, diapers for old people. We built uh, kitchens for school, for a school, a uh, little park. We did a whole bunch of stuff to improve the quality of life of those people. I eventually did visit, was very well received. Kids were singing and dancing and uh, I got the, the bread and salt treatment. And, uh, and most people in Eastern Ukraine speak Russian, but some of them do speak Ukrainian. So I went there. I was also in Kyiv and then I was in Lviv, which is a wonderful city. And again, when we're talking about the sort of connections of, of languages and peoples, one of the other, aside from uh, Radio Svoboda, another major source of my uh, listening and reading in Ukrainian was the history of Ukraine. And I have a number of these um, audiobooks, e-books. I in particular liked Leonid uh, Zaliznyak, and so I listened and listened and listened and read in Ukrainian. I discovered, lo and behold, what I didn't realize that Ukraine had a history which involved the original Kievan Rus, which involved being invaded by the Mongols, which then involved them being conquered by the Lithuanians who were welcomed by the Ukrainians because they were pushing back against the Mongols. Uh, that eventually become becomes the Lithuanian Polish or Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. The Poles are, uh, but, but there's a whole history of, of interaction between Ukrainians and Poles. And so that the vocabulary in Ukrainian is closer to Polish. I don't know if the Poles influenced the Ukrainian language or the Ukrainians influenced the Polish language, or they all came from some church Slavonic. I have no idea. But the fact is that from a vocabulary point of view, Russian is a bit of an outlier and uh, the Ukrainian and Polish and even Czech vocabulary are closer. However, all of a sudden I began seeing, you know, and then you have uh, the Poles were kind of trying to force the Ukrainians to become Catholic, which the Ukrainians resisted. And there was a whole bunch of unpleasantness resulting eventually in the Melnitsky rebellion, where basically everything to the east of the Dnepr River went over to Tsarist Russia with the promise of some independence, which turned out not to be the case. I only mention this because my learning of Ukrainian involved following the day-to-day -day events in Ukraine and also learning a great deal about the history. And so then when I visited Lviv, so here you are in Lviv. Again, if we talk about fusion of cultures and so forth, Lviv before the war, before the Second World War was 50% Polish, 30% Jewish, 20% Ukrainian, because the Ukrainian speakers lived in the countryside. And Lviv, which was known to the Germans as Lemberg and to the Poles as Lvov, was the fourth largest city in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And so you see in Lviv the sort of evidence of these different national, historical, religious, you know, buildings, there's even an Armenian church there. Uh, and so again, it's this sort of blending of cultures. And uh, another thing that I, I firmly believe is that the, our culture and our language is not in our DNA. So there are lots of people in Russia who have Ukrainian family names. That doesn't mean that they're Ukrainian. There are lots of people in Ukraine who have Russian family names, who may even have Russian parents or grandparents who may even speak Russian. In fact, half the Ukrainians speak Russian 
more often than they speak Ukrainian, from what I can gather, whether it's 50, 50, 60, 40, I don't know. But those people identify as Ukrainians. So the DNA is not the issue. It's, it's what you want to be that is the issue. And that's kind of part of the problem right now that the Russians are not prepared to accept that regardless of the DNA of individual Ukrainians, they, in their majority, not all, majority, want to identify as Ukrainian, want to have a separate existence as Ukrainian. And their language is well worth learning. And I have never believed that there are great languages and small languages. Like after Russian, I learned Czech. Czech has 10 million speakers. Russian has 100 and who knows, 180 million speakers. It doesn't matter. Um, every language is wonderful, is beautiful. There is no more beautiful language, more important language, greater language. It's whatever you want to learn. And as you learn that, you discover a whole bunch of things about that language, culture, place, history that you didn't know before. That's been my experience with every language that I have learned. And I'm discovering it now with Arabic and Persian and a little bit of Turkish that I've done. So, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a disjointed rant here. Following up on the video where I said we're offering free Ukrainian on link to anyone who wants to learn Ukrainian and free access to link to all Ukrainians, refugees or resident in Ukraine. I should point out that that offer is valid for all refugees. Uh, so I'm hoping that Syrians and Afghans will uh, take advantage. Uh, as of today, I think we have 3,600 Ukrainians who have approached support at link to get free access to link. I'm hoping that other refugees will also do that. And we're going to produce tutorials uh, in Ukrainian and also Sahara at Link can help to provide a Farsi uh, version of these tutorials for Afghan refugees who speak Farsi. And hopefully we can do the same in Syrian Arabic or even in standard Arabic and in Pashto, if we can find people to help us with those versions. So a bit of, again, I tend to wander on these. I hope that's of interest, a little bit long maybe, but um, that's how I got involved with Ukrainian. I've probably forgotten a few. Oh, I should, yes. One of the things I did when I went to Lviv, where I met with my online tutor, Solomia, and we set up a system whereby she took me around Lviv. We visited churches and cafes and, and uh, cemeteries and all different things that, you know, monasteries and we would just speak Ukrainian. And she would type up in her little cell phone all of the errors that I made in terms of, you know, of usage and phrases and, and words, and she would then send them to me by email. I would import that into Link and study it. So we did that from nine to 12. I go back to my room, I study it, go back to two o'clock and two to five. And we did that for five days. And that is a tremendous way to discover the city of Lviv and also to work on my Ukrainian. Uh, so I forgot about that. Uh, something I would recommend. In fact, I, when I was in Kyiv, I was thinking, boy, it would be great to be able to connect with a tutor and say, look, I want you to take me around Kyiv. We're gonna speak Ukrainian or Russian, whatever the case may be, three hours in the morning, maybe just morning. And then I can study all of that and we go back to it the next day and the next day and the next day. So, and we could do that in Italian in Spanish or Chinese or Japanese, wherever you are. Uh, sort of integrating that one-on-one -on -one contact with a tutor and yet then getting the sort of text of, of the problems you had, studying them on link and going back to it again the next day. Anyway, thank you for listening. I hope it wasn't too long. And uh, I'll leave you with a, a couple of videos where I um, talk about Ukraine and speak Ukrainian. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.